The concept of limit is a fundamental and analytical rich tool to do mathematics that we need in analysis. Until 18th and only 19th century, there were only rare instances in which the idea of limits was used rigorously and correctly. For the first time, limits were needed to resolve the four paradoxes of human. In the dichotomy, zero puts an object moving a finite distance between two fixed points against an infinite series of time intervals during which the motion is supposed to take place. Zero's striking conclusion was that motion is impossible. The first important contribution to this development of limit concept was made by some of the Greek mathematicians who were working on problems related to geometric measurements. Greek historian Herodotus believed that geometry was first discovered among Egyptians and originated there from the practical need for resurging of the oil flooding of the Nile Valley. Greeks used the method of exertion to calculate an area by approximating it by the area of a sequence of polygons. Fredoxus did this method on a scientific basis. For rigorous proofs of formulas for areas and volumes of simple geometric figures, Archimedes devised very ingenious arguments that actually involved some of the technical details of what we now call limits. As an infinitesimal is an arbitrarily small quantity which early mathematicians found necessary to incorporate into the place in the absence of a proper theory of limits. In 1586, a Dutch mathematician and engineer, Simon Stephen, obtained the theorem of the triangle of forces using infinitesimal techniques. On the other hand, Kepler found a useful approach to the problem of infinitely small in astronomy. In an astronomy nova of 1609, he announced his first two laws of astronomy. The second law, that is, the law of equal areas, states that the radius of the general of planet, the sun, sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time. In handling problems of areas as these, get a part of the area as made up of infinitely small triangles with one vertex at the sun and the other two vertices at points infinitely close together along the orbit. Also, in his treatise, New Solid Geometry of One Devils, published in 1615, Kepler's approach involved dissecting a given solid into an apparently infinite number of infinitesimal pieces or solid indivisibles of a size and shape convenient to the solution of a particular problem. For example, he regarded the sphere as composed of an infinite number of pyramids, each having its vertex at the center and its base on the surface of the sphere, and height equal to the radius r of the sphere. Adding up the volumes of these pyramids, the formula for the volume of a pyramid immediately gives a formula for the volume of a sphere as V is equal to AR by 3, which is equal to 4 pi R cubed upon 3, where A is equal to 4 pi R squared, is the surface area of the sphere. Here in his volumetric method, dispensed with the Archimedean double reductio ad absurdum, and in this he was followed by most mathematicians from that time to the present. Bruno Ventura Cavalieri was led to his method of indivisibles by Kepler's attempts at integration. 
he described this method in a few influential books, namely Jane Kerr's interview of 1635 and six geometrical exercises of 1647. He regarded an area as consistent of and of lines and a volume as consistent of parallel and equidistant plane sections. Kevin method of comparing two geometrical figures by comparing the indivisibles of one with the indivisibles of another is based on a principle that is still known as Kevin theorem. And so, if the area or volume of one to figure is normal at once, then it goes into other. Here, we illustrate Cavalieri's method by deriving the formula for the volume of a circular cone C with base radius R and height H. For comparison, let us take a pyramid P of height H and having unit square as its base. Now, if Cx and Px are the sections, then a simple computation gives that area of Cx is pi r squared x squared upon h squared, and area of Px is x squared upon h squared. Thus, area of Cx is pi r squared times area of Px. So, according to Cavalieri's volume of the cone, C is pi r squared times volume of the pyramid P. But we know volume of the pyramid P is one third of H. Hence, volume of the cone is one third of pi r squared H. A similar procedure, though far from rigorous, led Cavalieri to a correct result, which is equivalent to the basic integral of a function x to the bar k for small values of natural number k. So far, we have talked only about integration techniques used by various mathematicians for solving area and volume problems. But as we know, in an analysis course, we first learn to do differentiation and construct tangent lines to a curve. Only after this, we study integration and its use in the calculation of area under a curve. This, however, is an absolute reversal of the historical sequence of discovery. In fact, Sina was the first to deal with maximum minima problems. But somehow, taking into account the characteristic behavior of a function, nor its extreme value. For polynomial curves of the form y is equal to fx, we noted a very ingenious method of finding points at which a function can take a maximum or minimum value. An explanation that perhaps is closer to modern perception than those of Sima might be presented as follows. If fa is maximum of the function f at point x is equal to a, then on pictorial grounds it can be seen that at the point x is equal to a, f changes values very slowly. Hence, if e is very small, and A plus E is a neighboring point of A, then FA and FA plus E are approximately equal. That is, FA plus E minus FA is almost equal to zero. Also, we know that if F is a polynomial function, then the difference FA plus E minus FA in values of F at these neighboring points will be divisible by E. So, if we carry out this division, we can say that the quotient of this difference with E is almost equal to zero. 
but the limit of the quotient f a plus e minus f a upon e as e approaches to zero is the derivative of f at a. Consequently, same expression of the remaining terms that involve e amounts to writing f prime a is equal to zero. However, Seymour himself did not explicitly require that e be small and said nothing at all about taking the limit as e approaches to zero. As you can see, these new derivations and methods involve the concept of a tangent line at point P of a curve as the limiting position of a secant line PQ as Q approaches P along the curve. One such method was described by Isaac Barrow in his geometrical lectures published in 1670. He proceeds to describe what is apparently his own modification of an unpublished method that Freeman had devised to construct tangent lines through a curve defined implicitly by f x, y is equal to zero. To illustrate Barrow's method, consider an indefinitely small arc in n of the curve, and let us write n x comma y and n x plus e comma y plus a for their coordinates. Then f x plus e comma y plus a is equal to f x comma y, which is equal to zero since n and n are both points on the curve. Next, delete all terms containing a power of a or e or products of these as all these terms have negligible value. Ignore the distinction between the indefinitely small arc n n and the straight line segment n n and using similarity of triangles T T N and the differential triangle N C N. We solve the last equation for the slope y by t is equal to a by e of the tangent line at n. Although tangent methods of Barrow resemble the process of differentiation, the apparently did not perceive its deeper significance. Nor was he able to justify why the higher powers of A and E should be neglected in his calculations, which, for a rigorous foundation, can be explained only in terms of limits. Newton, as first inventor of the differential calculus, used throughout his mathematical work a facility to deal with limits of ratios of geometric quantities. In Book 1 of Principia of 1687 and in the Quadrature of Curves of 1693, Newton reported his method on the concept of prime and ultimate ratios. The showroom to the section 1 specifies by the ultimate ratio of evanescent quantities is to be understood the ratio of the quantities not before they vanish nor afterwards, but with which they vanish. Those ultimate ratios with which quantities vanish are not only the ratios of ultimate quantities, but limits. Towards which the ratios of quantities decreasing without limit do always converge, until which they approach nearer than by any given distance, but never go beyond, nor an effect. A term to still quantities are diminished in the certain. In due quadrature, Newton explained the method of sections in terms of prime and ultimate ratios. He rejected indivisibles and took motion as central concepts. In its mathematics, quantities are generated by motion. The velocities of the motions are called fractions and the quantities generated are called fluids. We can best understand the work of Newton in this direction by considering his example in which the areas ABC, ABDG, 
are generated by the motion of the ordinates BC and BD. Since the line BCD moves uniformly over the base AB, so the ratio of flexion of ABC to flexion of ABDG is same as the ratio of BC and BD. Newton defined an augment as a small increment. Nascent means coming into being and prime means first. So, according to Newton, the ratios of the fluxion are very nearly as the augment. As you can see in the picture, the ratio of the actual augments is given by the ratio of areas of BCCD and BDDD. But if we consider the prime ratios of the augments, that is, the ratios when they first come into existence, then fluxion of ABC divided by fluxion of ABDG is the prime ratio of nascent augments, which is same as the ratio of BC by BD. The augments or increments of AB, BC, AC, say X, Y, S are respectively BB, EC, CC, say del X, del Y, and del S. The actual augments are in the ratio del X is to del Y is to del S. If CT is the tangent line, then the prime ratios of nascent augments are given by CE is to TE is to CT, or X dot is to Y dot is to S dot. Thus, in modern notation, the derivatives dx by dt, dy by dt, ds by dt are to each other in the prime ratios of nascent augments, that is, X dot is to Y dot is to S dot. Newton's emphasis here was on the idea of a point moving on the curve from C to C. This he achieved by diminishing the augment CC, CE, CE. And so, as C approaches to C, the triangle CCE becomes triangle CTE and called CC becomes tangent CT. The necessity to talk about nascent and evanescent organs is clearly related to present-day practice in setting up a finite difference and then considering the limit of the difference is reduced, that is, approaches zero. Lemma 1 of Book 1 of the Principia is, in effect, Newton's attempted definition of the limit concept. Quantities and the ratios of quantities, which in any finite time converge continually to equality and before the end of that time approach nearer to each other than by any given difference, become ultimately equal. In modern notation, we would say that for a given epsilon greater than zero, if the distance between ST and GT is less than epsilon for T sufficiently close to A, then limit ST is equal to limit GT as T approaches A. Quite often, it is said there are hundred answers but thousands of questions. So, let me ask you a question. You tell me, how do you arrive at a further the definition of the limit concept? What we have seen just now suggest to accept Newton as the person who defined limit for the first time in a way we use today. Also, Jean D. Lambert used abstract delta to define differentiation, and Bernard Bolzano did the same for defining continuity. Course DNA of 1821 by Augustine Louis Cauchy is based from the outset 
on a reasonably clear definition of the limit concept when the successive values attributed to a variable approach indefinitely to a fixed value so as to end by difference of it by as little as one wishes, this last value is called the limit of all the others. The importance of epsilon delta approach lies in the fact that it provides a powerful tool to deal with the fundamental concepts like continuity, differentiability, and integrability analytically, and that too in a very unified manner. But for a learner, carefully crafted definitions mean nothing until the drawbacks of genetic and intuitive understanding about the limit concept, continuity, and so on are fully exposed. We hope this program must have been successful in exposing some of the drawbacks. At least, we must have pushed your limits of knowledge of the limit concept. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.